Welcome to the Celtic Huddle Podcast, I'm Mark Wilson. Today I'm joined by the Celtic legend Simon Donnelly. We will be joined live by former Parkhead star Mark Burchill. We'll also be joined by Derek McGregor for the Scottish Sun and John McGarry from the Scottish Daily Mail. Both journalists have followed Celtic's season closely and they'll give us their inside view. So, okay, we're a brand new podcast. We keep saying every week and we'll take you behind the scenes and in depth in all things Celtic. I'm delighted to say once again, the podcast is now sponsored by First Star Legends Gin, First Class Transfers and Social Recluse. We thank them all for their support. So today, as usual, we've got a cracker for you. We'll look back at the worst 10-day period in Celtic's history in this millennium. Anyone without an agenda will certainly now admit that it's looking very unlikely that the title can be won and it's all for Rangers to lose. After last night's 1-1 draw against Hibs, Celtic trailed by 21 points and it only looks as though the gap will widen. We will look back at the disastrous Dubai trip that resulted in Chris Julian getting COVID and Neil Lennon and 13 players having to self-isolate. We will also go deep on the depths of the rebuild that is required at the football club. So, let's get to it. No time to waste, Sid. Um, let's start with last night, just briefly. Saw the game. 1-1 against Hibs. Yeah, not enough again. Not enough depleted squad, you could argue. You know, a couple of... Well, one kid getting his debut, uh, young Harper. But I think there was enough there to still go and win the game. And they had to win the game. I've been saying it for weeks now that every game was a must-win game. This was another one. And it's two points dropped. And as you say, I'm ever the optimist, but the league's gone. Mm, yeah. OK, well, now's a good time to bring in Mark Burchill. Mark, how are you doing? Thanks very much for joining us. Actually, Mark was there. It is, he's back. <laughs> Hurry up, Burchy. Where were you? You hear us okay? I can, I. How's it going? All good, all Hi, good. Burchy. Thanks. Good to see you. Mate, just speaking to Sid there about, uh, first and foremost, last night's game. Uh, don't know if you've seen it, but 1-1, one, one, depleted squad, 13 players out. I mean... Much of the same for Celtic, is it? Even even with the, the ones missing, it was much of the same performance, in my opinion. What do you think? It was. I think the difficulty was that no no real focal point up front. I think that was a big problem last night. You had a lot of good possession, but really trying to get shots on goal and chances was difficult. But as you say, 13 players out, it's so difficult. You know, you're looking for three points every single game at home, but unfortunately, last night, they couldn't hold on. And, uh, and the other thing is, you know, another set play... Another set play at the end of the game. How many times have we seen that this season? Celtic losing goals with set plays. It's something they need to work a bit harder on in training. But it doesn't matter which players are actually playing. It's the same team. Always set plays are letting them down. Mm, that's right, Sade. I mean, it's I, a good point, but you yep. makes when it, when it went and when actually the foul was conceded. I, was I thought, oh, here I was we go worried. again. But it, was, it, it, it can't a, be a coincidence. It was Every a, week it seems to be a set it play. It was a silly foul to give away late on in the game, you've got your noses in front, a fantastic free kick, and you look as if you're going to, not steal the three points, but get the three points late in the game. It's a needless foul. And honestly, I felt the same, the same feeling came over me as when, when Hearts get the free kick round about the box in the final. You just, at the moment, you just do not have any confidence in defending set plays. Mm. It's another one that they lose the first ball, it bounces, the young keeper has a flap at it, I'm not sure who touches it on the line, it falls to Nisbet and it's in the back of the net and it's two points dropped. It, it, as Butchie says there, it's it's something that has been a thorn in the side of Celtic throughout this season. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Laxalt, you, you mentioned the foul getting given away. I think Laxalt was guilty of that all the time. Um, just dangling a leg and conceding fouls around the box. No good when you can't defend the set pieces. But look, let's go into the bigger picture now, Mark. I mean, 10 in a row, in your opinion, now over. Even that most hardened Celtic fan, uh, you know, I'll find it very difficult to say you can catch this back. You know, I think the Rangers are a steam train at the moment. They're, you know, they're just brushing everyone aside. And as I say, you know, 21 points. Yes, you can win your three games in hand, but that's still 12 points. You know, you need 12. to try and catch it somehow, somewhere. And that Rangers need to start losing games. You need to win every single match. Really, really difficult. Is it impossible? No, it's not because there's still points to be won. But can they do it? As I say, very difficult to do it. Well, that's the thing, Sid. I mean, there's a number of things that have to happen for Celtic to even be on with a chance of still regaining this title. You know, first and foremost, they have to sort themselves out by winning their games. 
And I thought the game after Dubai, regardless of 13 players out or in, it was a must win after what mm-hmm. came with Dubai. And they didn't win, but they need to win their three games in hand. Does that look likely at well, the minute? We were just talking before we came on here. They've got Livingston in the next two games. Now, the first one's with this depleted squad because of the, the 13 players that are out. The second one is through on the plastic pitch at Livy. Livy are on a high now. They're on a great run. And I don't have confidence in Celtic walking away with six points from these next two games. Mm. Uh, as I said earlier, we've been saying for the start of this show that every game's a must win. But... I think it's it, it's gone now. It's gone. Yet they had to go to Ibrox and take something. We spoke about it last week. I took heart from the performance at, at Ibrox, but then Rangers go and negotiate a hard game at Petodre, where every Celtic fans hoping they slip up. They walk away with another three points, mm. and Celtic drop two points uh, the following night. Yeah. So I mean, that's the on-field stuff. It said, like, give, give us your opinion. Uh, the stuff purely off the field and what's happened in this past week, ten days. What do you make of all this? I mean, we chatted it's briefly about the Dubai we thing, did, but... We did, and I didn't, I didn't quite bullet? condone it, but I, I did see you at the time. I thought there might be a wee bit more because I kind of backlash to the Rangers game, but I've had probably time to reflect like everybody else. It's been a disaster, an absolute disaster. Uh, unnecessary pressure put on yourselves again, going away. At the 11th hour, they probably should have had a, th- a rethink on that trip to Dubai. It's come back to bite them in the, the backside big style. Julian's obviously contracted the virus. They're in close proximity on planes, buses, and 13 players have had to self-isolate. The managers had to self-isolate. You couldn't make it up. Mm. You really couldn't make it up. Mark, what's your opinion on the full situation? Uh, uh, what's happened off the pitch in the past week to 10 days? You know, a lot of criticism about going to Dubai. I suppose yeah. if you come back from Dubai and you win the game, and nobody has to self-isolate, then maybe, just maybe it gets brushed under the carpet. But when you're looking at the management team, the players isolating, and you see the damage it's actually caused, and it's another point, couple of points dropped, it's hard to defend now. It's hard to say that, oh, we didn't do anything wrong. Completely. Uh, and that's exactly it. You know, when Celtic and Rangers are involved, there's always, it can go one or two ways, isn't it? You know, and... It seems to be either you win or you're completely at the top or you're at the bottom. And this obviously went the wrong way. I think the, the big thing is the 13 players out. And as you say, when you, you said earlier, if you win that game and you come back to Dubai, the week looks like good training. You've been working on different things. You know, you've know, you been working on set piece defensive, defensively or whatever it may be. You come back, you win the game, you move on. You say, right, we're going to attack the end of the season. But having, you know, went there, Julian getting COVID, you know, the players having to miss the game and then, and then drawing the match. It just as you say, it's just you know it becomes more and more just heavier pressure put on the put on the club and the team. It's really difficult. Yeah, and in terms of look, in terms of PR exercise, has it been the biggest disaster for the club in many many years? PR disaster. See, when you looked at it, and I got the text messages last week. We chatted about it last week, Dubai, and I couldn't quite believe that some of the pictures that were emerging. But then to come back and. John Kennedy came out and says, look, there'd been some minor slips of protocol. You know, the Celtic own Twitter page had put up the players working hard to try and, you know, quell those those angry fans. But, I mean, it's just an absolute PR disaster when, you know, as I say, John, who, who's a pal of mine, great coach, but he comes out and says, well, everybody doesn't know the full ins and outs and we were well protected. But, I mean... They've come back just, and they've had to isolate, so it makes a mockery uh, of that full statement. You're putting yourself there to be shot at. You know, you're putting your, you're putting huge pressure on yourself. As Butchie says there, if you win the game, there's still, you know, there's still 13 players self-isolating. Uh, we've all been there. I've been in trips there where you go and first couple of days you might have a, a beer or two and then you work hard. And I forget, no doubt Celtic will have worked hard in that mm. week. But in the current climate, you've got to be a wee bit self-aware, I think. Everybody back here, restrictions, a pandemic going on, and it's, it's it's maybe all very well me saying it in hindsight, but as you say, it's a PR disaster. It's came back to bite them in the backside last night, dropping the points, and effectively the league is over. Mark, do you we, think? We, and this, sorry. on you go, on you go. I'm saying we've all been there. You know what it's like. As soon as the, you know the, the other team in Glasgow is ahead of the other one, the microscope is on you. You know in Celtic, you know, having been perfectly 
performing well this year. So the microscope is on them. So going to Dubai and having people being able to see them and see that, you know, it was maybe no exactly what we were doing back home with the restrictions, etc. You know, it hasn't been great, as you say. And it's, uh, I think it's backfired, to be honest. You know, and I think if they had the, the, the opportunity to do it again, they wouldn't go. Yeah, well, look at this from Stephen Doherty is tweeted in here saying, I know family who have paid £2,400 for a season tickets. Watch stuttered garbage all season on TV, not seen family members in a year. Then they see this. Come on, no excuse. Now, it's a good point. We all know what's happened. We all can see that these Celtic players and management have to miss last night's game and Saturday's game. Yet, I'm still hearing... You know, people come out and Gavin Stratton saying that, no, we stand by it and we were, you know, it, it was okay, we, we played within the rules. Is that about time somebody comes out and says, look, we've got this totally wrong, we apologise, we can see why everybody's offended, it was it was the wrong, wrong road to go down. Is yeah. that going to happen from somebody at the club, I, do you think? I think it should happen, I don't know if it will happen, but for, for every Stephen Docker there, you know, there's, there's thousands more that are on the same boat. Uh, as I say, it's affected everybody f- from this time last year. You know, restrictions and and stuff, and, and and the Celtic fans have been asked to to pay that money, and that's why that's why there's such fury and frustration amongst the fans. Mm. And now that's why we we probably seen those scenes five six weeks ago outside the park or a month ago, whatever it was. It's a built up frustration. They they don't feel. But surely after that, see, after those scenes, Aye, that should have been everything to make yeah. the Celtic fans happy. Yeah. Instead of saying, yeah. we're going to go to Dubai and incite it like even, yeah. even more, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mark, I mean, look, you were there more than 20 years ago when it was it was tough times under Joe Vengos and John Barnes. Can you see similarities at the club in terms of the feeling from the fans and, and the kind of just everything negative really happened around the club just now? Definitely, it's something I've actually thought about, you know, and you know, and you, you talk about the fans being in the stadium and not being in the stadium. Is it helping Celtic? Is it not? You know, and I tend to think, you know, back then, you know, it was really difficult to play at times when you're you're so far behind Rangers. Really difficult. I felt players, your senior players as well, struggled under that pressure. So I, when when Celtic had this tour run, I thought, see, not having fans, it might help. You know, it might it, at times it could help the players to play with a bit more freedom because you know what it's like. Anyone playing with under uh, in front of sixty thousand fans, and I know the happiest. It's difficult. It really is difficult pressure. But I, I, I can see the similarities, and, and and what needs to happen is they need to get a bit of direction quickly and decide how they're going to go forward. You know, I think that's kind of what happens when Martin O'Neill came in. He kind of took over the club, and I'm not saying at all that there needs to be a change of manager or anything. You know, it's, I've just said, you know, the club has to be focused and streamlined in what they want to do. You know. Signing players, everything you want it to be all working together and try to get you know better performances on the pitch at the end of the day. Mm. So you think that's missing just now? You think you know as a, oh, a bit ragged just now? I, 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 I know so. you said you don't think there should be a change, but how do you sort that out then at this minute? If I don't really know. I just think that in any of these occasions when you're not performing well, and as you say, so many things are going wrong. The COVID, you know. It, you know, losing matches that probably didn't deserve at first, then you start to go on a bad run, then you start losing those set plays. These are just things that can happen sometimes, you know. And, and at Celtic, it's magnified times ten to every other club, you know, the, you know, in, in Britain, let's say. So it's just one of these things. And, it, and 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 what they'll be saying, what Lenny will be saying is, you know, we need to close ranks, we need to get ourselves back together, we need to start winning football matches. And then you know what it's like when you start winning football matches, everything changes, you know. Uh, you know, everyone can be a bit more positive and then you just try your best to try and close that gap as quickly as you can. Mm, I wonder, I just wonder if that time has, has came and gone, even if Celtic do one match, is, you know, I, I I understand what you're saying, Bertie, but here here's another one that I just quite liked, a good thought, and a lot of Celtic fans saying this as well, uh, Terry Tibbs, and then the one player who catches COVID is the one player who shouldn't have been there in the first place. Of course, Julian, you know, out for months with that knee injury, um, no, I, I get just, warm weather training camps to bring <clears throat> injured players back to to fitness quickly. But should Julian have you even been there? It just adds to the to to the to the farce of the whole ten days. To be honest, it's unfair on <clears throat> the likes of Julian because, as I say, we've we've been there and players of players have joined the party to go and do their rehab. But this is a guy who's four months away from playing again. It's not as if he's two weeks away and you can mm. take him there and. 
you know, get him running. He's he's out for a a significant period. So again, it's just another thing you can target the club with because unfortunately it's it's a guy who quite possibly shouldn't have been there. Yeah. It's got it, but that's who's to say it could have been somebody else. You know, I don't think Julian getting it is the issue. The issue probably is putting ourselves in that position that for this position. to happen. Yeah. Look, so what do you do? Mark just mentioned there briefly at his time and after his time, Martin and Neil came in, blew the full place apart. Celtic went all out to get him, ripped the he ripped the sheet up, started again with his tactics, with his players, big spending. Is that something that needs to happen just now? Is Celtic at that junction in the road? I think they are and listen, we've we've lost our jobs recently yeah. in football and you don't want anybody to lose their job, but I think Celtic's now at a position where it has to change. I was arguing last week because I still felt they were in a title race. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I didn't see the point of a total rebuild whilst there was still a chance. And I know mathematically it's still possible, but realistically it's not. You know, they're too far behind now. So maybe now is the time, you know, to go and rebuild and, and look to, to next season. I know a lot of the fans want that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a big decision for the club, but there, there definitely needs to be some sort of change. Yeah, well, Peter Rooney here, just he's tweeting in saying, what is the point in Neil Lennon coming back after isolation, which, you know, <laughs> it does sound harsh, but, uh, you know, and I'm the same as you said, but don't like people losing their jobs, especially if we've went through it. You know, everybody's been through it, Mark himself. Yeah, I, I, yeah. But <laughs> I just wanted to remind you, I didn't want you left out there, but you the, the sacked clan. <laughs> but I mean, Celtic is uh, at such a, a kind of perilous point just now, where the, probably the season's gone. You need to start looking towards the summer and next year. And how Rangers are looking so strong, you'd imagine the strength in the summer. But the European qualifiers and stuff coming up, I, I begs the question about this January transfer window. Then, in terms of players, Mark, I know you are kind of into the. You're into the kind of recruitment scouting side of it as well at Bournemouth just now. You're yeah. still doing that, aren't you? As now yeah, right. would now be the time for Celtic to be getting their house in order in January rather than wait to May, June, July. You say Should that, there be a but clear January, out? You, you say that, but January is a very difficult window to 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 trade players. You know, to bring players in and move players on. You know, if you're saying. You, you, that Celtic should go and sign three, four, five players for next season. Are they going to, you know, the finances it takes to do that in a January window are very difficult. Would players want to come to, to Celtic at this point when when you're, you know, you're so far behind it in, in the league table? I think there's a lot of diff different, difficult things in January, you know, and as I say, it is a difficult market with COVID and transfer fees at the moment as well. What, what, what he, you would like to think that some younger players will get get minutes to find out if they're going to be ready. You know, I think that 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 can be an opportunity to you know. I knew I know a few of them had uh, played last night. Are the other younger ones are they going to be ready to come in and play? Difficult. You want to try and put plans, and uh, and every season you want to try and put plans together for the following season uh, as quickly as you can. This does look like a point that Celtic can start something, something you know, some sort of rebuild to getting themselves for next year. But then, as I say, it's very, very difficult to try and move players on and bring players in. And if you want to go and make marquee signings, I think it's January, as I said previously, that is a very difficult month to do that. So for me, it would be about just getting the best out of the players you've got at the moment. Maybe adding one or two players that can maybe Lenny feels he's got, you know, he's a bit weak in areas in his team. And then try and mm -hmm. just get the best out of this season. And as I say, trying to get a few of the young players in the team to find out if they're ready for next year. And then you can build towards your signings for next season. Well, I, oh, that's an interesting point, and I, I, I totally get what you're saying about the January window being tough. The young players, I mean, that's a good point. Now, we've seen a few of them last night, and, you know, there's a few we've seen before. You know, my big one, we were just chatting about him, said Dembele. Now, Dembele got, you know, very limited game time last night. I think the last time we've seen him was the first game of the season, maybe, against Hamilton, where he came on for a wee cameo. He's been lauded as this world beater, but... He's getting to an age. What, is he seventeen now? I'm not sure. I'm not 17, sure. But, uh, top players. Top players. But you know, top players play at seventeen, do they not? So is it about time we actually see some of these guys getting ninety minutes rather than five minutes at the end of games? That that would be fantastic. But as we all know, to play for Celtic Rangers in a team that's no winning, performing really, really well is difficult. So you know, you know. 
I would love to, you know, as a you know a Celtic fan, you'd love to see the younger boys coming in and getting minutes. But undoubtedly, Lenny needs to win matches, so he's going to play his best players and the players that he feels he can do it on that on that day. So you know, it's a balancing act to try to try and yeah. go. It's hard there. Michael Rogers is is agreed. Why doesn't Karamoko get phased into the team? Nothing to lose now. Lennon initially said he wasn't where he should be physically now, that he's not going to grow to a six foot <laughs> player, but you can still see nice touch. I think some of the Celtic fans are the same as myself and wondering. It's exciting. It's I exciting to win. watch. I covered a couple of games the tail end of the, the season before, you know, when he came in and he looks apart. The, these guys behind the scene, Lenny and the coaches will know better than us. They work with him day to day. We had a couple of really good boys that you played with, Gold and Suter that were 16 at Dundee United that played. But again, it is a balancing act, as Bertie says. It's Celtic, and I know the guy there saying there's nothing to lose, but you still need to win games. Mm. Uh, but I'm, I'm all for giving youth a chance, and these guys that played last night, and the likes of Dembele, the boy Henderson I've seen before, I like the look of, aye, maybe it's time to give them some game time as yeah. well. Well, it'll be interesting to see if that's the case, but look, it, I think there's always going to be question marks over this next few weeks about the, the manager, probably more than the current playing uh, staff, and if Neil, Neil will survive another few weeks. Now, we chatted briefly about some of the names in the hat a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we wondered if Strachan, and there was Martin and Neil, I think they ruled themselves out, but Mark, one that keeps coming round again and again is Eddie Howe. I know you know him very well. Now, would he be a, a guy who would fit in to the kind of the Celtic dugout pretty easily, or or what does what would he bring? What kind of coach is he uh, to Celtic well, if he had to take the job? I think I, I think the point the the, the the question is what kind of coach is he, and that's exactly what he is. He's a coach, you know. I think that's the uh, undoubtedly that's his talent is, is is coaching and man management and getting the best out of players and making players better. You know he. Uh, Anyone who's watched Bournemouth over the last five years, uh, when he was in the Premier, when we were in the Premier League, he's a very attacking, attacking-minded. You know, he loves playing two strikers. You know, he's a, ah, he, he loves fast, flowing, free. You know, free football it gives the, the players, you know, kind of a structure to play within. But then, obviously, within that, then they can go and you know they can express themselves. You know, he's, yeah, you know, in the face of it, he looks like a a, a manager that that. Any club would want that likes to play nice, fast flowing football, you know, and that's what Eddie will bring. Would would, would bring any, to any job. That's what he would do. Yeah, and what about his not right? Okay, that that's that's great, and that sounds you know very similar to the mould that Brendan Rodgers was or, and turned it to be for Celtic. What about his knowledge of the game up here? We know managers have have scouts up here, and we know they keep an eye on the game. But would he know enough about coming up here and say, say he had to take this job in January, hit the ground running? He would. He would know uh, what he's, I, I, he's stepping into. I think these top level managers, I just think they've got their eye on everything. You know, that's what I've become. You know, I think Eddie, to be a Premiership manager, yes, you know, you, you encapsulate yourself 24 7 with your own team, but the, I think you have to know what's going on elsewhere and you have to know players and clubs. And, you know, I'm sure that since Brendan Rodgers and Stephen Gerrard has came up here, every English manager would have had a, have had a much closer eye on what's going on up here, the players, the way the teams are playing. So I would imagine he would have a a, a real knowledge of, of Scottish football if he was ever uh, ever want to take a, a, a job north of the border. And what about the Celtic job? I mean, up here it's it's the be all and end all for for a lot of managers. It's a pinnacle for like. What's your opinion of managers that are down south like Eddie Howe? The Celtic still as an attractive a job as it was, you know, when they were qualifying for the Champions League year after year. Would he? Would you think that he would jump at the chance if he was offered it? Do you know what I think that Premiership managers obviously you want to take finances out, it don't you? Because you know the, the finances in England are you know astronomical compared to. But the thing about being manager of Celtic is you know instantly you, you, you're going to be playing in front of sixty thousand fans. There's no you know not every Premiership club has sixty thousand fans. You know that and the world world will support that Celtic have got. I think. Play, you know, having the opportunity to go and win trophies, you know, I think that's something that you know your your normal Premiership manager, you know, can go ten, twelve years, maybe no winning any trophies, you know. So I think that that could that can be something that would entice someone north of the border. And also, I, I think the fact of being able to play European football, you know, I think that would be 
something that would be a carrot for for anyone down south. We'd be looking at it saying, you know, maybe uh, I never got the opportunity to work in Europe or play or win 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 cups and leagues. You know, I think it, you know, I think Celtic jobs it speaks for itself. You know, I think that if anyone gets offered it, you have to think about it seriously. Yeah, and and what do you think? Do you think he's ready to get back into work? As he, I know these managers sometimes take sabbaticals and they go out for a year, but would he be one that's is ready to go if asked? That's a difficult question. You know, I, I think you need to ask Eddie that. But I, what I would say is that uh, you, you know, got his he, number. You want to phone him <laughs> just now? We'll wait for you. <laughs> just get him on the Zoom call. <laughs> ah, he came in. <laughs> no, I think that you know. As I said earlier, I think these top managers are always learning every day. They're always ready, you know, for that next challenge, you know. And uh, you know, I, look, I don't like talking about a manager coming into Celtic. And I'm trying to just talk about the Celtic manager job because Lenny's still in a job, you know. And who's yeah. to say that, you know, who's to say he isn't he the manager for the next five years? So you know, uh, and me as a Celtic fan, you know, growing up, you always back the manager until the day that he's not at the club, you know. But what, but, but go back to Eddie Howe. For me, he's a top manager. He, he is very, very good. And if if any club got the opportunity to get him in, then they should jump at it because he, as I say, he's a very good manager. Yeah, well said. There's Stephen Cohart uh, agreeing with you there, Eddie Howe. A good shout for the next Celtic manager. Brilliant, Burchie. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll we'll let you off the hook there. Try and get Eddie on the on the phone and <laughs> give us a call next time we get you. But listen, keep well. well. And uh, I take it what you're up to just now. I, I take it like us lockdown. You can't be travelling about Europe, can you? <laughs> No, that's really difficult. Can't get into any games. You know, we only get tickets for the next three fixtures. So everything, ninety-five percent of the job is done on video on the computer, just watching games of targets, whatever they may be. You know, it's difficult, and it's you know it's been going on for long enough. And fingers crossed, it gets sorted out sooner rather than later. Yeah, top man, Butchie. Thanks very much for joining us. Hopefully, I see you see you soon, mate. Thanks. Bye, boy. All the best, Butchie. Cheers, Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. No, that, I mean, Mark makes some some good points here. You know, a going reference for Eddie Howe. I mean, that'll be interesting. His name keeps popping up time and time again. And, you know, I guess it's just a matter of time. We'll, we'll wait and see what transpires over the next few weeks. But delighted to say now that we're joined by John McGarry and Derek McGregor. How's it going, guys? Good, Mark. Not Thanks for having John. Good, good. Derek, uh, was it yourself? You were there last night, were you? I was. I was in, I mean, we asked Mark, um, what did you make? Uh, first and foremost, the news that 13 were, were going to be out and the management team and secondly, the performance of the guys that did actually play. I think it was quite a, it was quite an extraordinary day, Mark, in that uh, I think obviously it was, the, it was the nightmare scenario for Celtic post-Dubai that they were hoping that obviously amidst all the controversy of going and and being there, that they would they would come back and avoid any COVID issues. And uh, of course, when the news emerges during the day, immediately you're wondering if the game will go on. Um, just extraordinary, unprecedented set of circumstances. And uh, I think when the game actually got underway, and you obviously, I, th I think there was such an eager anticipation of what the Celtic lineup would be. And in actual fact, it, it was still a team of decent pedigree. Um, clearly, you had Cameron Harper making a debut. Um, you had Stephen Welsh having to come in uh, alongside Shane Duffy. And I think Duffy's presence was a surprise as well, given that I think John Kennedy had ruled him out over the weekend um, due to you know the, the so-called COVID bubble reasons. But... I think the actual performance of the makeshift team, I thought, actually was very good, Mark. Uh, I think you're up against a, a good Hibs team with, with know-how, um, clearly motivated. Um, and I thought, all things considered, it was a good performance. If they'd been able to see that result through, it would arguably have been the best one of the season, I think, given everything you know that had been happening. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And John, I, I mean... Derek makes a good point there. The the Shane Duffy situation is quite a strange one, is it not? When it was mentioned a couple of days ago by John Kennedy that he was out the bubble, but then he comes back in and Gavin Strachan says yesterday that he comes back in off the negative test, but I don't know if we're missing something here. Does it not incubate for at least 10 days or, or something like that? Just another situation to add to Celtic's calamitous season, is it? 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was just another example of something that just doesn't make sense, you know, and, and very little has really from the, the get-go in, in June, you know. I felt the whole game was just a classic case of you reap what you sow, you know, you take the chance, they get out to Dubai, you're hoping against hope that you might get away with it. Um, and, you know, almost inevitably, given the way that everything ha- seems to fall for Celtic this season, the news comes through and, um, you know, then the, it's a, then a lottery in terms of the, the track and trace <coughs> assessment, isn't it? Um, yeah, and it's, you know, I, I have yet to, you know, and in the main issues in football, you kind of get divided opinion. I've yet to hear anybody out with Celtic saying that going to Dubai was a good idea. This, this is not people making a judgment on this in hindsight. People said it before. People said when they were going out there, when the pictures emerged, um, it was a calamitous decision uh, to compound the many that we made off and on the park this season. I think given the yes. amount of out, Mark, I was, I was wondering if you or Simon would get a shout to take the boots along last night. <laughs> They're not that desperate. <laughs> I seen a cru- I seen a couple of teams on social media before the game. I thought I was going to get shoehorned in. <laughs> <laughs> but look, guys, the I mean, John makes a good point there that nobody thinks this is a good idea. I th- I totally agree with you. The Dubai trip. So, uh, Derek, it begs the question: Why are the club still defending it? Why are they still coming out after it and saying, "No, oh, it was listen, we stand by that." Should they not just cut their losses and say? We got this totally wrong here. I mean, should they, should we not be reading in in, you, in the sun from yourselves that yep, Peter Lowell, a statement has said that we got it wrong, or Neil Lennon or such and such. But why is that not happening? I think I think there's almost like a, an unwise stubbornness about it. Um, I mean, I, I'm utterly convinced that I think deep down the the, the hierarchy, I think, will, will realise that you know. With hindsight, it was a mistake. They, they, they didn't read the situation well. And you can argue all you like about the actual football merits of the trip. But I think morally, and I think given everything that clearly the nation's putting up with, the Celtic fans, of course, that are having to deal with restrictions and, and so on, it's, it's having a terrible effect in people's lives. It just wasn't a good look, you know, for, for Celtic to go away to Dubai. Um, and I think we're all, I think we're all still quite amazed that from the, the, I think the moment between the end of November and actually flying out to Dubai, that no one at the club had an instinct that this might not be a good idea, even last minute. Um, you know, I, I, mm. I'm pretty sure that there, there'll come a time when, when Peter Lawwell may well give us all a, an appraisal of the decision behind it and. You know, possibly even confess that, you know, on balance, it was a mistake. Um, and I think, as John said there, uh, you know, the, 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 the subsequent COVID test and the, the self-isolation period, it's almost like they're reaping what they've, what they've sown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, some of our former teammates have lined up to to give some honest assessments because, look, let's, let's face it, that's all, all you can do. A lot of people covering the tracks here and saying... Things, things are all quite rosy at Celtic, and it'll, it'll all be okay. Don't think it is, but here we go. Sky Sports last night. Andy Walker. We are seeing some dismal governance from Celtic. There is unbelievable arrogance. The Celtic supporters deserve some contrition from someone at the football club with any backbone. I mean, John, is he spot on with that? Absolutely, yeah. The the, the statement that Celtic put out to attempt to find the trouble was completely disingenuous as well. To suggest that Julian could have got COVID in Glasgow is, we've seen many instances of that, but clearly the whole situation of going to Dubai um, brings in aircraft travel. You know, Christopher Julian isn't flying home from Lennox Town in a, a charter jet, you know? So the minute that happens out there, you know, it's, it's then a lottery in terms of how many people are going to... Um, miss out on the game. To suggest that it's just an unlucky break and nobody could have foreseen it, I find it's a little bit of an insult to people's intelligence. Yeah, look, here's a point from David McKendrick, just wrote in, a lot of the fans describing the attitudes from the club as arrogant, maybe captures it accurately. 
I mean, a lot of a lot of people think that way. L- listen to this one: Daily Mail, Chris Commons, and on Twitter, um, Chris Sutton. So Chris Commons first uh, in the Daily Mail, saying the trip to Dubai backfired spectacularly, and it's another embarrassing situation. The club ought to be ashamed of themselves. This is a club so out of touch with reality; it almost beggars belief. This has t- turned into the season from hell. A Celtic works from one disaster to another. Chris Sutton then followed that on Twitter by saying, what an absolute mess Celtic are in from top to bottom. The trip to Dubai and Chris Julian contracting COVID. Peter Lowell and Neil Lennon need to take ownership in this one. Derek, would you agree with that? I mean, in terms of where the buck stops, that that as Peter Lowell and Neil Lennon, it has to come out and say, or, or one of them, <laughs> even come out and say, look, I'll take this one. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. I think, in fairness to Neil, certainly from the, f- the football point of view, and, and you know, it's been a calamitous season in many respects. I think, in fairness to Neil, he's he's never shied away from taking responsibility for that. He's he's fronted up, you know, he's faced up and he's taken that responsibility. And obviously, in terms of the trip to Dubai, Mark, clearly there's a culpability, you know, for for Neil as well. Ultimately, Peter is the one who would have sanctioned it, who signed off on it. Um, and I agree with John that uh, the, the statement that Celtic put out uh, yesterday, I thought really it, it just made things even worse for them in terms of uh, perception and, and, and how it came across. Um, you know, the, the, the notion that even if they'd have stayed here, they could just as easily have had the, the same issues. It, there was just absolutely no trace of regret in it whatsoever. Um, and you know, it, it, it's been, it's just been a a, a, a massive blunder, uh, to put mm. it mildly. But yes, of course, the both of them, the both of them have to take their fair share of responsibility for it, Mark. Yeah, look, uh, we're getting comments down the side here. Gerard Hackett, I agree a hundred percent with Andy Walker. Um, then Joseph Aiken saying they can't come out now and say they got it wrong because they've defended it far too much. That's kind of the case. I'm feeling said that they're. They've backed it too much. It's difficult now to come in and say, listen, yeah. we were actually kidding you on there. We didn't, uh, you know, we, we didn't defend it. But it's a hard situation they're in now. They've made for themselves, eh? It's ridiculous. I said earlier on, it's pressure that you put on yourself. Totally unnecessary. You can take it back to to ball and golly at the start of the season and, and falling behind and having to catch up right through to this Dubai trip. As I say, I, I, I never knew about the Dubai trip until more or less... The, the game against Rangers last week mm-hmm. and you just take a wee bit of time to reflect and you think you're just putting yourself out there if something goes wrong you're putting yourself out there to be absolutely slaughtered and that's that's been the case mm. look it's uh, I mean we've seen the, uh, the fallout from it we've seen the Green Brigade obviously hanging banners up there's banners outside the stadium again you know you know kind of slaughtering that but guys for for the good of Celtic now um should Dermot Desmond take control of this situation? I know he gives day-to-day running to Peter Lowell, and that's Peter Lowell's job. But there came a time in in 2016 when Ronnie Dyler, you know, he looked like his time was up, and I think it was clear to everybody that Dermot stepped in and put an end to it, and we all seen the success that brought. I mean, John, what do you think? Is it time for Dermot Desmond to, to step in and take over this kind of shambolic season? Well, if you look back at uh, the years that Dermot Desmond has been involved in the club, whenever you approach these kind of moments, it's when he tends to kind of get involved and take a real interest. That's what will happen here. Um, whether it happens imminently or it goes on behind the scenes and the season just kind of limps on between now and the summer um, remains to be seen. But uh, there's no question that he'll he'll take control of this and we'll, um, we'll be looking to... You know, obviously, publicly they cannot give up on this season. We're still automatically impossible, eh, possible, and the, there's still a Scottish Cup to play for. But the league, the league, are right off. You know, they're they're out of the the League Cup, they're out of Europe twice, um, and it's a question now of of where they go from here and and building from for next season. The problem they've got is that as things stand, they're going to find it extremely hard to sell any season tickets. In, in the current situation, because people feel um, short change by one way of putting it. People have paid upwards of £500 who haven't actually been inside Celtic Park once 
feel pretty angry about the whole thing. Not 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 just losing the league. That that is one aspect of it. But the way it's been lost, the one bad decision compounding the next one in Dubai kind of being the the tail lid on it. They've got a, an awful big job in their hands to win these people back over. They're going to have to do something pretty spectacular, probably in line with an appointment like Brendan Rodgers, in order to get people back inside. Yeah, Derek, I mean, do you, that's a good point John makes here. Something spectacular. I mean, season tickets maybe amount to £25 million a season, some, somewhere along that. Is uh, now time to get someone spectacular in just now rather than summer? Uh, and and hope that you can get somebody in summer, or just go all out, get them just now, and start rebuilding. I mean, you were talking about Dermot Desmond um, kind of taking ownership of this, or, 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 or kind of coming out and making a statement. And as we all know, I think throughout Dermot Desmond's tenure, he's not really one that makes statements. They're they're very very rare. Um, but what he what he what he, what he tends to do is make. Um, dramatic moves it's by action that he he makes his statements and and obviously there's been no bigger one than when he brought Brendan Rodgers in you know in terms of a wow factor that was that was huge um now the theory was that at the time he felt he had he had to act big uh, in the aftermath of a an embarrassing cup semi-final defeat to a then championship Rangers and he certainly acted with conviction um will he do the same again this time I, I think it could well be the case, you know. Clearly, season ticket sales are massive for Celtic. Um, I think certainly we're looking at a, a tumultuous summer. I think for Celtic, I think there could be huge change from top to bottom. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Dermot decided to to opt for the a, a kind of so-called Hollywood name as such. So, so just to jump in there, you are the guys in the know. You are the guys, Scottish Daily Mail, John. Derek's at the Sun. You are the guys we read. You always have we insights. Who are the names then? We mentioned Eddie Howe. Who is the Hollywood name that could be brought in? In your opinions, I think it's. I think it's. I think it's quite intriguing, Mark. That over the last few days, it's it's emerged that uh, apparently Roy Keane is anxious to get back into management. Now, Roy Keane would clearly split opinion, but it would also create massive. Attention for Celtic would be massive news. Um, I think Dermot Desmond, if if indeed he is going to make a change, Mark, because to be fair, so far, the uh, Dermot and Peter have backed Neil all the way. Um, so you couldn't, I, I know it might look unlikely, but you couldn't totally 100% rule it out that they stick with Neil. But if they decide to go for a change, then... Dermot Desmond may look at what Rangers have done with Stephen Gerrard and he may well opt to go down that route as well. A name that makes an impact. Uh, but Roy, with a Roy Keane one, Roy, Roy Keane knocked up back uh, when Lenny left the last time, did he not? So what's what's different? Why would he want to take it now? Well, of course, Roy Keane subsequently, uh, I think, uh, mentioned in his book that he turned Celtic down because of, of what he saw as a kind of lack of ambition. But... I think Dermot Desmond's the type of man um, that if he's single-minded, if he still thinks that uh, he wants to go down a certain route, he will go down that route. And I don't think it's mm. implausible to think that he may well go back to Roy Keane. Well, uh, there's one. David Grant has tweeted in, uh, agreeing with you. Roy Keane, Stroke, Bruni and, and Duff. I take it that's Damien Duff. But, John, who's the names that you're, you're hearing? Uh, similar yes. to Derek? But it, 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 this will all boil down to the, the kind of the, the pool um, that Celtic will look at will boil down to the the job description. Um, you know, if the the new man um, and we assume there will have to be some sort of change is given the chance to build something, given control over the budget, control over comings and goings, then you open yourself up to a, a bigger market, potentially bigger managers. If the manager's been asked to work under certain constraints, isn't it allowed his own backroom staff? Is it allowed um, uh, other aspects that he would uh, he would normally uh, anticipate? Big managers aren't going to be that interested in the job um, because that's just the, the nature of the the game. So I think I think before before kind of the um, shortlist as such can be looked at, 
you need to see what the structure of the club's going to be. And I think that is um, the real fascinating aspect. And there, there could be, you know, as Derek said, you know, changes from, from top to bottom, which will then define who the manager is likely to be. Yeah. Yeah, well, listen, I've got to agree with that. I, I don't think any top manager is going to come to a club where he's going to be dictated to. I think we've seen that when, you know, Celtic bust the bank with Martin O'Neill. Martin O'Neill ran the show. I think Brendan Rodgers was very, very similar. And in between, it's been it's been a whole lot different with the other managers. So that will be interesting. Guys, just, uh, just to finish off then, um, I, I mean, there's an opportunity for Rangers to dominate possibly for the next three or four years. So this appointment is... Is critical. I take it you are the same as us that you think Rangers are are champions just now. He's going to put yeah. your neck in the line. It's I not think, really on the line. I think as good as Mark. Yeah, I mean, I think Rangers yeah. have been really impressive this season. I mean, irrespective of the the countless issues involving Celtic, Mark, I think Rangers have been uh, superb this season. And uh, you know, I, I think there's a relentlessness about them at the moment. And, you just can't envisage the collapse it's going to need for Celtic to get back into this. Yeah. John, I agree? Totally, totally agree, yeah. I mean, it's, they've not lost a, a league game yet. You know, they, they might lose one, but I, I wouldn't think it's beyond them to go the, the league season. Uh, in terms of Rangers getting into Champions League qualifiers, Gerrard hasn't lost a European qualifier, so that, that money might come their way. Um so, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the pendulum is beginning to swing a wee bit and Celtic are going to have to do something um, pretty substantial to, to kind of bring it back in their direction. Yeah, OK, well, let's just leave it there. Just quickly, guys, predictions in for Saturday's game at home to Livingston. Livy on an unbelievable run. <laughs> are people seriously going to believe that Livy can actually go there and win? What's your predictions for the game, Derek? I think it's possible Livingston could go there and win. I think Livingston are a proper team and, and they're in a, a great run of form. And naturally enough, they're going to take encouragement from the fact that, I think, uh, as was confirmed last night, they're going to be facing a, a similar kind of Celtic squad. So no Edward, no Christie, no Ayer, uh, no Griffiths. So they, they have to go there with belief. I think Celtic will avoid defeat, put it that way, Mark. OK, John, Saturday's game. Yeah, well, I saw Livingston um, at Ross, uh, play Ross County the weekend and they were excellent again. Eight, eight straight wins on the bounce. Um, very tactically astute. Uh, and the, uh, absolutely no reason to think that they won't go to Celtic Park and get at least a point. That's actually where Celtic are at the moment. Yeah, that certainly does. Guys, thanks very much for joining us. Derek McGregor, of the son John McGarry, the Scottish Daily Mail. Thank you for your opinions. Good, Hopefully speak to you Thank soon. You. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Sid... Your opinion, I mean, John's John's right, and uh, and Derek as well. It's a tough game for Celtic at the weekend. It's a tough game, and it's a sign what of the times thinking? that the two guys are actually predicting draws. Celtic at home to Livy, it's a sign. It's where we are. It's a picture. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go for 1-0 Celtic, and even that is a sign of the times, because usually I'm a lot more bolder. Mm. I think 1-0 Celtic at the well, weekend. Yeah, that does paint the picture. 1-0 against Livingston. A year's gone by, you would say this would be a cricket score, but that's where we find ourselves just now. So, Jam Pack Show. Thanks to Derek McGregor for the sun, John McGarry, Scottish Daily Mail, and of course, Mark Burchill, who came on earlier on the show. And thanks for everybody for tuning in. Also, thanks for our sponsors, First Star Legends, Jin, Social Recluse, and First Class Transfers. We'll see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>